Hello everyone and I hope you're all doing extremely well. Today we're having a more thorough look at the ECM, the jamming ability of different aircraft in DCS. So this comes off the back of three videos that I've done so far. They were to testing the Vigan, the U22 Alpha jamming pod that you can get for the Vigan. The reason I tested them in particular, or the Vigan, was because there was some dispute whether it actually worked or not. We did two tests that were inconclusive, then a third test that confirms it definitely does work. With using the uh, jammer pod, the U22A, on the Vigan, I got about an 11 mile decrease in the range that a Grumble, F series Grumble, could fire at me. And I had a large percentage miss rate of the missiles, which then decreased to zero once I got near to the target. So we found that was pretty well modeled. And so what we want to do now is compare it with the other aircraft and see which ones have better ECMs and in an air to air fashion as well as air to ground. So the first thing to say is that I thought this experiment here would cover air to air and air to ground. It turns out it doesn't. There's a major problem with this example I'm going to show you today and relating that to air to ground. So I'm going to have to do a full air to ground video in terms of ECM jamming on a different day. And this will just cover air to air. And I'll explain the reason for that as we go along. So before we look at today's experiment, we need to look a bit into the background, the understanding of real life jammers, what they do, how they work, and then what we've got in DCS, because it's two, two very different things. And there's good reasons for that that we'll talk about later in the video. In fact, before we look at that, let's look at today's content. First, we're gonna look at the background uh, of the ECM. Then the next experiment we need to do is to work out whether jamming in DCS is currently kind of point-based or area or volume-based. So we'll experiment with that. Then we'll look at comparing different aircraft and their burn through range in terms of jamming. Then we'll look at missile evasion in comparison and comparing different aircraft jammers in their ability to evade missiles. We'll draw then the conclusion of the tests. And then finally, I've got some thoughts that I'll add, I want to add about the future of ECM based on comments that you guys have been making. So first of all, a lot of people watching this video in the future are not going to know what a jammer is. A lot of people are still very confused what an ECM is, what electronic warfare is in DCS and in the real world. So let's kick off with that. So in history, electronic or ECM electronic countermeasures suites were added to planes in earnest in the 1950s. And this was a response to the Soviets had created radar guided missiles for shooting those aircraft down. Started with the SA-1 and they moved on to the SA-2. The SA-2 had the famous fan song radar, and I forget, sorry, I forget the name of the radar for the SA-1. So the case study we'll take is the B-2 Vulcan bomber for the British that was designed to go into Moscow, basically, and drop a nuclear bomb. And so to beat the SA-1 uh, and the SA-2, they equipped it with an ECM suite. And back in those days, the generation one of ECMs were very simple. All they would do is create radio noise in a band, a frequency band, that they knew the SA-1, or, or in this case the SA-2 fan song, would be scanning in. So the fan song would do its search and its track in a certain kilohertz or megahertz of radio. So the Vulcan would create noise. I call it white noise, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but it would create radio noise in that frequency band. And what that meant was when the fan song pinged its radiation out and then that echo would hit the uh, Vulcan and then come back into the receiver on the antenna of the fan song, as well as receiving that echo, it would also receive a bucket load of randomized noise in that particular radio band. And because uh, there was a big lack of processing back then, you know, we didn't really have digital computers back then, or at least not as we know them now. So it, what it couldn't do, it couldn't pick the spike of the echo of the aircraft out above the millions of spikes created by the noise. And the only way the fan song could actually pick out that Vulcan would be when it got close enough, say 10 miles, 15 miles, whatever it is, I don't know, that the power of the actual echo spike coming back from the Vulcan was loud enough that it could be easily seen above the, uh, the numerous spikes 
of the noise and then it could be say then the fan song could say right that's the Vulcan now I see it I can now get its speed I can now get its height I can now get its azimuth all the things that it need to be able to shoot it down and that range would be called the burn through range and that burn through range would differ based on the type of ECM that the airplane was using and the power of the you know, the searching radar and the, you know the, the the noise filtering ability and blah 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 and so that was how it worked we literally have a couple of buckets of uh, of radio noise creating ECM in the back of the Vulcan and a massive wattage you know the more wattage it can put out the bigger the return of noise that the fan song would see and the harder it would have to search for the echo spike real echo spike from the Vulcan but as time moved on the microprocessors invented allowed the search and track radars to filter better and better and see those echoes in that noise so beyond the 50s you couldn't just create noise in a radio noise in a band you had to do more and more things and there are as well as creating noise which modern contemporary jammers probably still do there's a whole load of other stuff smart stuff that they do the majority of which probably is still mostly classified so we're not actually going to know most of the stuff that goes on it's probably the most highly guarded secret in military aviation so as well as the noise it's doing all kinds of things and a lot of you guys can tell me a lot of those things it's all a bit above my pay grade to be honest but if we get back to the question which is what does DCS simulate it just simulates that first level what the Vulcan had and it's ECM buckets it just creates noise and not even as detailed as, as the Vulcan it just creates noise as far as I'm aware in DCS in all frequencies I think that's right all of the jammers in DCS world are simply noise creators I think the function can be directional so you can have a jammer that just works in front or behind and I believe the wattage is also measured you know the power of these noise generators so some noise generators which is you know what a jammer is in DCS are going to be more powerful than the others and that I think is as far as DCS will go so it's a very basic modeling of the of the uh, jamming system which is which is great for me I think that's fantastic so next we need to find out a little bit more to add on to that what I want to find out next is whether the ECMs the jammers either the noise creators are area based or if they're point based so do they only so if I've got an F-15 and I'm jamming do does it just affect my plane or do I actually create an area a volume a sphere whatever of jamming around me so that's the first experiment we've got to do to answer that question now I know we could go away and we could send wags an email and we can ask him and that's probably what we should do with all of these things ready but it's more fun experimenting together and finding out so I'm gonna experiment and find out so we come to our example test number one here decides whether it's area based or point based and test number two here is going to look for burn through ranges and evasion ranges so what we've got here is my f15 and here we've got a jamming ai flanker uh i think he's jamming no he's the one that's not jamming and two miles away to his right going the same speed same altitude whatever is an f15 and he is jamming so i want to see if the jammer this F-15, who will show up as a jammer on my radar, and we'll talk about a bit what that looks like in my F-15 in a bit, can also hide this guy, or can it not hide this guy? And that will answer the question, is it point-based or is it area-based? So let's get on that. So we're going to jump in the right plane. Off we go. Radar on. Just going to turn the sound down. We don't need loud sound today. Okay, head straight forward. And what we can see already is we've got contact ignore these guys here that's the other experiment on this experiment we've got a jammer strobe on the left and a contact on the right and they're about 30 miles away or so and I should say that this strobe here this strobe which are these guys along here is what we see if the guy is jamming or I don't want to say hostile because it can also be friendly and in fact in this case it is a friendly but what we're seeing with this jammer here is that we cannot find its IFF we cannot find it with its coalition we can also not find its range because this scale up to down here on my radar scope is the range you can see that guy's at just under 30 miles we cannot find its speed we cannot find its height we can find nothing about it if it's jamming except its azimuth even if they're jamming we can always find an azimuth so we know it's there somewhere that way but we don't know how far and hence why we can't launch missile there is an exception there are some cases where we quite can call can launch missiles against a jammer i think we've got two home on jammer missiles in dcs but generally speaking generally speaking it's not effective to launch missiles at jammers and that is how we're going to assume that we're going to work in this uh, in this video 
So what we can say is that with the two mile distance that these guys are between at the moment, this jammer here does not appear to be having any effect in cloaking or jamming this guy here. So that's fine. Why don't we be thorough and move them a little closer together? So let's move them to say 5,000 feet, shall we? Try and get that fairly precise. Let's run the sim again. Go, radar on. Let's head towards them. Let's try and get a result. And hey presto, look at that. In 5,000 feet, we can no longer see the flanker on the side because it's being hidden, cloaked, if you like, by the jammy aircraft, the F-15. So what we're gonna have to do is go forward and see what happens as they get closer. Stop. Pause. And we're just gonna double check the range make sure that adds up with what I've been experimented with and it does perfectly right so what I can tell you with that is that at 21.5 miles away from me I could then see the flanker in fact I could actually see them both at that point uh, there was what I had reached what we call the burn through phase so it turns out that it's area based it's not point based this guy here's jammer can encompass a uh, an area around it and that area it's uh, due to early experimentation I found is 6,200 feet or approx one mile. So this F-15 will cloak anything around it until the cloak, until the F-15's burn through range of 21 miles, which essentially means if we have these guys flying in formation uh, within a mile of each other, then just the one guy jamming will essentially hide them and make them not technically invulnerable for, for the sake of this test here, invulnerable to missiles until the burn through range of 21.5 miles and the actual burn through range is going to depend on this guy's ability to jam his jammer and this guy's ability to scan the power and the processing ability of this radar so i've got one more thing to add to that it is nice literally nice and simple with the area effect of the ecm it is literally one mile so if you're inside that area effect of one mile it has one effect if you're outside of that one mile it has no effect it's nice and binary there's no there's no interpolation and i know that's probably not realistic but when you you know you've got to actually simulate it you've got to do work to simulate it that makes perfect sense to me so we're going to move on to the next test which is okay now we know it's area based so for that experiment we can tell that the distance between these guys has to be more than one mile so that they don't interfere with each other and that's fine we've got nearly four miles three and a half miles between each guy what we've got here is my listener again or you know my, my searcher it's an f-15 and we've got five randomly selected jammers we've got an av8b with a dcm pod an ags 37 with a dcm pod or a u22a a flaming cliffs 3 flanker a flaming cliffs 3 f-15 and an a10c with the alq uh 184 i think it's called alq 184 yeah so the best of the jammers for this guy is what we've got now this won't be a perfect experiment there will be errors like in all experiments i do there's errors because there's only so much detail there's only so much time i've got so the first thing to say is how these are all ai controlled aircraft how realistic are they to their human counterparts uh, the answer is I don't know. I don't really have time to test at the moment, but I can be pretty 90%, 95% sure with my workings of DCS in the last three years that they're going to be the same as the human counterpart. So I'm happy with that. I've also checked that to jam, they do actually have to have the jammer pods put on them. I know it sounds obvious, but for this AI carrier to jam, it does have to have this DCEM pod. Uh, oh, it's an ALQ164. I didn't know that. And so on. So all the basic logic is there, and I think it's okay. The situation is I am going to be flying through the middle here. These guys are an exactly the same distance from this point here, which is going to be what I've pre-tested as the first burn through point. So when I get to that point there with the geometry, these guys will all be exactly at the same distance from me within about 50 feet. Also, they are all going exactly the same speed, the same altitude, and they will all come in. I can guarantee they will come in at exactly the same time. And the reason I wanted them the same distance from me is that I want to fire some missiles at them, or I have been firing some missiles at them. Um, we'll do that in experiment two. This, first of all, we're just looking at the burn through range. So off we go. All we've got to do is keep ourselves on course. Altitude doesn't really matter much. You can see our five jammers in front of us. Speed up a little bit. Get our alpha down. And when they burn through, they'll change from a jam... Wee! Stop there. Just right there. Uh, they'll change from a strobe 
to a contact there and the way I'm testing it is I'm waiting until the strobe disappears over the contact so I'm going to a little bit further forward that may not be technically accurate but I think it's near enough for what we're doing I know there's always a delay on the RWR there on that B sweep there is when they disappeared and that is him him and him one four and five that is the A10C the AJS and the AV8B have all burnt through at exactly the same microsecond and I can guarantee they're all exactly the same distance because I've uh, measured it several times well within you know they're, they're very very close uh, 27.14 in fact we'll just go and check another guy I don't know who this guy here 0.16 miles out it's close enough they've all burnt through at 27 miles I think we can say so that's 27 miles for the A10C AGS and the AV8B and that's mm, that's a bit suspicious because they're all exactly the same in reality they have different power jammers in reality they have massively complicated jammers that we're never going to understand but it shows how simplified we are here in DCS so next we need to see when the big fighters burn through we're also going to get fast because we're going to start shooting soon gone left slightly so let's turn back Okay, we're about to burn through completely and wait for the B-Suite that erases them. Stop. So again, you know, because I'm waiting for that B-Sweep erase, it's probably not perfectly accurate, but, you know, as, as near as we need, it's going to be accurate. And what we can say is the two flaming cliffs planes, the two fighters, the 37 and the 15, are at both at 21 miles. I mean, I've done this experiment several times, so I can average and tell you that that is 21 miles. So that's all we really need to do for that experiment. And what we can deduce from that is that the fighters, I mean, we can change in and put other fighters in. In fact, I've done that and the fighters get the same value. The fighters get 21 miles burned through with an F-15 as our search radar and the ground attack planes, in this case, the A-10, the AV-8B, the AGS-37 and any other ground attack plane that I've tested get 27 miles. So what DCS engine is doing is it's rounding everything up into lovely little categories into, you know, one mile spread for that plane there to have its jam effect. Ground attack planes to have 20 mile, 27 mile burn through in this particular scenario with this type of radar here. And these guys to have 21 miles burn through. Obviously, the lower the burn through, the better. So that's the burn throughs done for now. Next, we need to do the fire range. So what I found in my vegan video is that the S300F Grumble fired missiles at me. And because I had my jammer on, on my Vigan, what happened is the missiles missed me. We calculated, we averaged about a 75% dodge chance at the maximum range of the grumble now i haven't got this figures in front of me they're about 25 miles and that effectiveness of the jammer diminished to zero the closer i got now i don't know if i didn't get enough data to see if that reduction in effectiveness was linear or exponential or whatever to be honest i don't think it really matters to anyone at that point in that level of accuracy but it showed that it there is a percentage effectiveness of jamming to actually dodge the missiles once the burn through has happened so now the burn through has happened i'm going to fire a bunch of missiles so let's get that done this is why i chose the f-15 i suppose i could have chosen an f-14 but i'm pause i go oh like that i go pow 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 oh i haven't done it right well done cat dickhead pow 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 one two three four that was between 16 and 17 miles, I believe we fired them. Watch this. Oh my god. They all hit. They literally all hit. That one, that one, that one, and that one. I know these guys didn't die, but they were hit and they're damaged. And that was feigned surprise. Now the reason that is, is because I've tested this. I've spent two hours now firing an F-15 missiles at these guys, and nothing misses absolutely every missile in every combination firing at different planes always hits assuming you're firing firing within the burn through and within the maximum computed range of the missile uh, that was a bit sh close that one i've done 20 something miles uh, and it's exactly the same and so i had to think about that well why is it that the aim 120c that we were firing there always hits 100 percent but the grumble ground attack uh, ground to air missile misses at least at long range well the reason is obvious when you um, think about it because these missiles are fox 3s they have their own radar on board once they get near the target within i can't remember the mileage i think it's time based instead of mileage but within let's just say five miles it turns its own radar on and 
locks relocks the target and tracks to the target well that means the maximum range that this missile is ever tracking at is five miles and we t spoke earlier to say that the efficiency of the jammer is proportional to the distance so the longer the distance the more efficient it is so at a maximum of five miles it's you know we're never going to get a miss it's never going to have the chance to be an efficient jammer at five or less miles so i thought mm, okay well we better fire fox ones at it so i've got a flanker and i've got a, a mirage and i started firing fox ones at this missile at these guys instead even at 20 miles exactly the same result every time the missile hits i cannot get the missiles to hit like i could with the grumbles and again the reason is obvious with a fox one because with a fox one assuming that we have to have well i'm telling you we have to have our aircraft close to this guy here our aircraft will be close to this guy by the fact that i need to keep my plane pointing at him uh, for the radar to be able to track and the missile to be able to track by the time that missile actually hits this guy i'm usually about well whatever that is you know uh, five or six miles away from him that's just how it works with the geometry of firing missiles so whereas the grumble but when its missile was hitting me the grumble was actually still 23 miles away or something when i'm when my fox one or fox three hit this guy then I'm only six or seven miles away. Again, and but bearing in mind that the effectiveness of the jammer is proportional to the distance, it never really gets a chance to jam. And so that leads me to the end result of that jamming is never effective against missiles. I can't think of a single air-to-air -air missiles. And this was where we're coming back to the uh, comment I made at the beginning, that this can only be relevant to air-to-air. -air. It cannot be relevant to uh, ground-to-air. Because the ground-to-air has the ability of being far away from the jammer once the missile impact but an air-to-air -air missile never has the ability of being far away the scanning object be that the fox 3 missile or the fox 1 missile or, or, or the aircraft donor aircraft firing the fox 1 missile will never be more than 10 or so miles away from the hostile when the missile impacts and some of you are going to jump up and say what about a phoenix it goes 130 miles you say cap yeah but it uses its own radar and it locks onto the guy you know eight miles or something with its own radar it's never far away further away than eight miles so that's the logic we've got there so we've actually learned quite a lot just in the last few minutes about how the system works and how it's relatable in dcs Okay, so we've shown the F-15 burn-through ranges and we've looked at if we're firing missiles. What we need to now do is build up some more data by changing this aircraft here to see if it makes a difference as to the distances, the burn-through distances. We won't do any more missiles because I've already tested that thoroughly in the background and that doesn't make any difference. But uh, burn-through range, burn ranges may change with the power and the type of this aircraft radar. So next let's go for, let's just pick another easy one, an Su-27. Let's get on with that. Okay, we've got burn through there uh, on the same guys, on the three ground attack guys. And they are the same again, 27 miles. And we can probably guess that these uh, two fighters are going to come through at 21 miles. There they are. Yep, 21 miles. So again, in SU-27, it works exactly the same as an F-15. Probably because it's an FC3 aircraft. We've got 21 miles and 27 miles for the for the ground attack planes. And I won't do any more FC3 planes because I can assure you they are all the same. But let's go and try something else. So we've got a ba -ba -ba, Mirage. Off we go. Mirage. Okay. Okay. Radar. Emit. Right. Well, so we've got a bunch of jammers there. Interestingly, you can actually see the chevron there for the A-10, but I'm pretty sure that's not meant to be... Yeah, that's not meant to be there. So we've got just jammers at the moment. Speed that up a little. Stop. So all of them came in at exactly the same time. So it's very different to the FC-3 planes. In this case, all aircraft have exactly the same burn-through uh, burn distance. Uh, so that shows that the burn-through distance is not actually based on these aircraft, per se is actually based on this aircraft because this one burns through all of these radars at 29 miles the fc3 planes burn through all of these uh, differently and differently in terms of proportionally as well and the range we're going to find is ba -ba -ba, 29 miles so 29 miles for all of them for the mirage next let's go to our beloved f18 off we go i'm going to move it back even further Okay, radar on. Radar zoomed out. Try and find these bad guys. There they are. 
and in this case with the Hornet there is no strobe at all because presumably jamming passively and you know hostiles jamming us just doesn't work in the Hornet at the moment and I can prove that by grabbing one of those guys getting a lock on him wherever he is and you can see I've got his range and his closing velocity so um, so there is no hostile jamming in the Hornet at the moment uh, which is 10th of June 2019 next we're gonna go the mighty Tomcat and unfortunately stand by uh, just to do his stupid stuff Unfortunately, there's no jamming in the Tomcat anymore. There used to be, I believe. I remember I did the tutorials and looked at the jamming. Unfortunately, it just no longer works anymore. You see these guys at 50, 60 miles. They're all jamming. I can prove they are because I can get an F-15 and show you them jamming. But uh, the jamming strobes just aren't working in the um, F-14. And so you're thinking, oh, Cap, you've done it wrong. You forgot to make them hostile. So I'll make them hostile. And I should probably just show you the settings of these as well. Uh, they are all on reaction to threat, passive defense, ECM using, always use, chaff, never use. And you can see, even as hostiles, they're not jamming, or we're not seeing a strobe or any loss of data there. We can still lock them up and fire at them just as we could. Uh, so, yeah, so hostile jamming is not working at this time in the F-14 or the F-14, which is very annoying for this video. So it means we've got very limited data to work with. We've got the FC-3 planes, uh, which all gave the same which all give the same result. That is uh, the other FC-3 fighters burn through at 21 miles and the non-FC-3 ground attackers burn through at 27 miles. I can't think of any other data that we can collect. Uh, there's nothing else here with... Uh, an air-to-air -air radar is there technically there's an F5 and a MiG-21 but I don't think that's worth it the maximum they can see is 40 miles for a start in fact why not what have we got to lose right we have five times strobes let's look for a burn through just doesn't appear to be working does it give it one more go there's the VSI there it is no it's not where is it Well, all of the strobes disappear, none of the contacts come up, but just out of interest, when do the strobes appear? 25 miles. Uh, now, I don't know if that's, I don't know why that guy's going fast. I must have changed something, but I don't know why uh, the burn through is at 25 miles and then they just disappear in terms of contacts. I'm a bit rusty with his radar. But I'm going to make the assumption that was the burn through at around 25 miles for all of them at the same time with the MiG-19 and 21. I can't remember how to use those radars. And the rest is FC-3, which is all the same. So some pretty crappy results there. I'm going to have to ask you guys what you think of those results and if you can kind of make any logic out of that. Okay, there is just one more test I want to quickly do, which is just to check, put him back as an F-15. I'm going to change this from an A-10C to an A-10A. Make sure it's got the jammer. Make sure that he is going to jam. I just want to do FC3 ground uh, against FC3. Okay, radar on. Ah, that's interesting. So it's not just the FC3 planes that burn through at 20 miles for the FC3 scanner because this guy here has burned through as well and that's one of the ground attack aircraft. So it looks like the um, FC-3 planes can distinguish between a ground attack plane and a fighter, whereas the Mirage and the F-5 cannot in terms of burn-through range. All very confusing, right? So what I'm going to do is quickly draw up a table here with the end result, and I'm going to have to let you guys conclude what we make of that in terms of a conclusion for the burn-through distances of different aircraft. And the conclusion in terms of the missile actually being fired at, we know it's just irrelevant. The uh, Because of the distances and the geometries involved, the jammer never appears to have any relevant effect on air-to-air -air missiles. So that's my findings from the experiment. And I just wanted to have a talk about the future of jamming modeling, ECM modeling in DCS. A lot of you are unhappy with the current jamming model that we have and want a superior jamming model in terms of complexity and I'm of exactly the opposite opinion so I want to try and talk them out of it so like you guys rightly 
say and know jamming is much more complicated than just radio noise creation it, it it's smart technology nowadays it, it does things it echoes signals it does processing and you know it's all kinds of complicated stuff that i don't understand you guys want that more modeled i say i don't want that modeled i want it modeled exactly as is it as it is i think it's perfect as it is it's simple really really simple it's just from what we've seen it's a couple of lookup tables and a couple of distances and that's it and the reason i don't want it i mean i've got no problem with it being more more, more complicated if it didn't come at a price and it does every everything comes at a price and the price is the processing power of our client pcs so you know imagine that we're in a grim reapers game we've got 20 human pilots 10 red four human pilots we've got 13 ships a whole bunch of ground radars jammers all these jammers all these jammers interacting with each other need simulated need modeling and that's going to cost currency that currency is the zero and one processing power of our computers it means just to do the same mission we would have to have massively more processing time there our frame rates will drop it'll be harder for people to play there'll be more crashes and ram usage and whatnot so i don't want to spend that currency on something that 98 percent of dcs players either don't want or don't even know exists in the first place so that's my first point and my second point is uh, a lot again a lot of guys ask for this more complicated jamming because they want to see the introduction of things like ravens growlers um, aircraft that are specifically there to jam whole areas deny whole areas uh, and a lot of russian planes as well i'm sure um to, to to jam you know shut down entire airspaces with ew and that's great i say go for it but you don't need any more programming in that we've proved we're here with my experiment it's already there everything you need is already there that f-15 gives a one mile radius anything within that one mile gets jammed and you can't see it you can't shoot it you can't attack it you can't you know we've just proved that there so all all ed to do to put the raven in or the growler in is do exactly the same thing they change their table look up table to say instead of one mile it's uh 25 miles for a raven at a certain height or whatever with this amount of wattage of jamming so all they do is increase that radius of coverage and that's it your raven's in there your growler's in there is it perfectly realistic to real life jamming no will it ever be no do we want it to be caps is definitely not that sounds like an absolute recipe for disaster so uh, i've been wanting to say that for a couple of years now and then i've got finally got a bit of, you know something to back me up there to uh, keep everyone happy let me know your thoughts as ever uh, next thing we'll be doing is i'm going to try and relate this to the ground um side of things i'm going to see if we can get similar results for the ground other than that i really hope that does help a lot of people and i'll see you later